Finding myself at a loss for words And the funny thing is, it's okay The last thing I need is to be heard But to hear what you would say Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to McKee Road Baptist Church. Uh, I pray that you've come expecting a blessing from God. I certainly have. I'm going to have Brother Dwayne open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Father, for the rain. Father, we need Amen. it. Father, we thank you for each one that is here today, Lord. We just pray that you just bless them. Give them your wisdom, your knowledge, Lord, as the word is preached. Father, we ask now that you just bless the pastor as he brings forth the word. We just ask that you just give us a good day today. Bless this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remember, you're going to get out of the service today what you allow God to do in your heart. Why don't we go ahead and stand together and we'll sing this morning. In my heart there rings a melody.
I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. I feel like holding the verses out a little bit, the notes. Is that okay? In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. I love the Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. I was waiting to see how many faces were turning red. That's a good sign to know. I try to cut it off before people start to collapse on the floor. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Amen. You may be seated. Young people, come on up here. Let's sing a song and we'll say some verses. We have some sick at home today. I'm missing the little guy up here. Okay. All right. All right. You guys ready? How many know this song? Know this song? Here we go. Who built the ark? Noah, Noah. Who built the ark? Brother Noah built the ark. Who built the ark? Ah, hang on, hang on. We didn't, let's start it over. We started it over. I thought we were reading. Yeah, we, I messed up. Who built the ark? Noah, Noah, who built the ark? Brother Noah built the ark. Old man. that part real well. <laughs> memory verses. We have memory verses today. I think we have group memory verses too, don't we? Okay, why don't you guys all come on up here, surround the microphone over here. Okay. Sky. Yes, Alice. Yes, I see the fruit. Here, why don't we come over this way. I'm going to switch you up a little bit. Come over to this side. I'm going to go like this. Guys, come on over here. Over here. Yeah, there you go. We got fruit over here. See the fruit? All right. That's fruit. It's not real fruit. Okay. <laughs> okay. You guys ready? Ready? Begin. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Does anybody else have a memory verse other than that? All right, turn around. There's some candy there behind you. We'll let you have that. Great job. I appreciate Miss Nina teaching the memory verses to the young people. So important that we hide God's word in our heart. Okay. Young people, you are dismissed. I'm going to have everybody go ahead and stand. Let's go around and fellowship and greet one another this morning. Shake somebody's hand, look them in the eye, and say, I am so glad to see you here today. All right, let's do that. Across a video, you may be seated. Came across a video. Here. Listen, go ahead, brother Painter, and play that. People are pumping gas and getting out and showing how astronomically high these prices are. So I almost contributed to the trend, but then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, "Before you record a video, take a trip down memory lane. Reflect on the season of your life where you were going through financially, and it was a struggle for you to put gas in your car. And then consider the fact that even though these prices are high," You have the resources necessary to fill up your tank. I stopped right there with that conviction and said, Lord, bless those that are struggling. And then I begin to thank God for his supply. Listen to me, y'all. I know that we're in a wild season, but this is what you need to know. Man's inflation has no impact on heaven's supply. Amen. Our God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches, not this world, his riches and glory. So instead of you joining the complaint department, Take a moment at the gas pump next time and just say, Lord, I thank you. God has been good. Praise him for it. Man's inflation has no impact on God's supply. As a child of God, we have a different perspective. We look at these things, we see everything else that everyone else is saying. The high prices, everything's going up. How can you afford it? My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Let's sing it. Another song, I Know Whom I Have Believed.
like these I sing out a song I sing out a love song to Jesus in moments like these I lift up my hands I lift singing through again. Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ this morning? I pray that you do. I mean, he's only given us everything that we could ever have. He's given us hope, peace, provided love in our lives. He's provided a means of salvation. He's provided a way that we can escape hell. How could we not love him? Sing it again like you mean it here. In moments like these I sing out a song, I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands, I lift up Morning by morning 
One of these days I'll figure out how to use my iPad to give me a break. I've only had it three years. So uh, you th I'm not joking. <laughs> I've had it quite a while. I just have been on this PC for so long. Open your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, if you will. So we're going to be in our text for this morning. Matthew chapter 9. entitled this message, Will You Be a Laborer for God? Will you be a laborer for God? McKee Road Baptist Church member, will you be a laborer for God? I pray that you'll consider that this morning. Think about maybe where you're at in your life. Think about, has anything changed? Have you grown spiritually with God? Have you grown in your relationship with God? to the point where you feel like His Holy Spirit is communing with you on a daily basis. Uh, it should be that way. It should be that way. I have you considered that. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35, it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when He saw the multitudes... He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Very familiar passage today. But are we laborers for God? Every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray. As I pray, ask God in your heart 
to do a work in your heart and life. Folks, time goes by so quickly. It's amazing. I was joking with a friend of mine. He was nine years younger than I am, and I said, isn't this amazing? You're so fast. He said, what do you mean? I mean, you're, I said, you're nine years younger than me, and yet we got to this exact same location at the same time. Time just goes by so quickly. It goes by so quickly. Before you know it, we will be in eternity. You will want to look back and say, I'm glad that I was a labor for Christ. Father, have your will and way in this time, these moments when you're in your, we are in your word. Dear God, I pray that you teach us through your Holy Spirit. God, convict us of where we are falling short. God, convict us of sin in our life. God, have your will and way in our lives. I pray, God, that you would do a work within this body this morning. God, for those Christians that are maybe just on the edge thinking, I don't know if I want to be so committed, God, burden their heart. Perhaps there are some that might need you as Savior here today, Lord. Today can be the day of their salvation. I pray that they'd listen closely. Perhaps there are some that are looking for a body to belong to. Dear God, I ask, move in hearts and lives. We ask you to fitly, continually join this body together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. The Key Road Baptist member, what is it that needs to change if we're going to really see God work in this body? Have you ever thought about that? What is it? Now, we can think of that corporately as a whole body of believers, a group of believers, but I want you to think about it individually. What needs to change in my life that I'll not hinder God's working in this body? We've been in the book of Acts for several months now. We'll be back there again tonight. We talked about how that they are all in one accord. It didn't happen by accident. It happened because they were in tune with God's Holy Spirit. They were walking in the Spirit, and they're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. That's how you are walking in one accord. But the question is, if everybody in this body were just exactly like me, would anything change? We need to each ask that question. One day, one day we'll all stand before God. Before God. We'll give an account for the things done in this body. Praise God, if you know Jesus Christ, your Savior, it's not the great white throne judgment. But still, you're accountable. Just like when you go to school and that time of test comes, and I would never be prepared, it seemed like, and I was just praying for revelation. No, I wasn't going to get revelation. But there was an accounting. The teacher wanted to know, what did I know? God wants you to follow him. He wants you to serve him. Someone said this, Lord, do things we're not used to. Think about that. Lord, do things we're not used to. That's a personal testimony. In my early 30s, this question came up in my heart. And I'm looking, and I'm looking around, and I'm saying, I've been saved for a lot of years, maybe close to 20 years at that time. Been faithful in church, had gone on visitation, had seen people saved, all these things. But there just wasn't, I was missing. I was missing something. What was it? I was not committed to God. I was not committed to God. You know, if God ever truly begins to do things that we're not used to, guess what? The world as we know it is going to be turned upside down. I've been talking to the people at the church here. I feel like God is blessing. Starting to, I'm seeing things, spiritual movement. He's doing things. We've had people that have joined the church. There just seems to be a good spirit and a oneness, and I'm praising God for that. And I said, be aware. If you start to do something for God, Satan will do everything he can to upset your apple cart. He'll try to mess you up. He's going to do everything he can. Now, sometimes we blame the devil when it's us. And owe, owe me on that, right? But God's doing some things. Here we were here 
on Wednesday night, we're talking about the church, and I enjoyed talking about the church on Wednesday night. And I, I mentioned as a kind of an as a side, how that, some lessons that I want to get to, and they'll be coming soon, but God has given us gifts in this body. And when he puts the body together, God fitly joins the body together. You know, you, if you like sports, you watch, especially at this time of year, baseball, I guess they, they're back on track now to play this year. And, and uh, uh, they have what they call the free agency. And these owners of the team will go around and we'll put this guy in this spot. We're going to pay this guy all this money. And they're trying to put together that best team. Well, guess what? God's got the almost, the most powerful team. When the church of God is hitting on all cylinders and it's exercising those gifts individually within the body that he has given us, there's nothing as powerful in this world. Nothing as powerful in this world. But it's got to start with, Lord, do the things I'm not comfortable with. You've got to change me. Things are going to happen. Jesus specialized in making people uncomfortable. You know that? He told the rich young, young ruler, remember, he said he told him to sell all he had, give it to the poor, and then come follow him. You find that in Matthew chapter 19. God's not interested in the status quo. God's not interested in me not growing. He's not interest me, interested in me staying the same or any of us. He has something for us to do. Oh, my. Either you really believe that God is true and the living God and he has a purpose for my life, or you don't. I submit a lot of children of God miss out on this. And they don't realize, they don't exercise the fact that he wants to do something in their life. But God has always been shaking people up. He's going to shake you up. And then guess what happens? He uses us to shake up the world. That's what happens. When God wanted to change the world, he told Noah, what? I want you to go out. I want you to build this boat. Called it an ark. What's an ark? <laughs> What's an ark? Well, you have to do it because it's going to rain. What's a rain? Walking by faith. He shook up his world. When God wanted to bring forth a great nation, he took this middle-aged businessman and he told him to get up and leave the Ur of the Chaldees. Talking to Abram. He shook up his world. He shook up his world. When God wanted to deliver his people, what did he do? He went to a man that stuttered, slow of speech, Moses. And he said, I want you to go to talk to Pharaoh. He shook up his world. When the Lord needed someone to hide the spies in Jericho, we talked about this recently. He went to Rahab, the harlot. He shook up her world. When God needed someone to defeat Goliath, what did he do? He went to that little shepherd boy. David shook up his world. When he wanted to deliver his people from destruction, that's where he chose the young girl, Esther. Shook up her world. When Christ wanted some men on his inner circle, he went to fishermen, tax collectors and the like, said, follow me. He said, drop everything and follow me. He shook up the world. Why? So that they could shake up the world. Shake up the world. God's not the God of status quo. The problem is no one wants to change. That's the problem. That's the problem. I have to talk about this because I always, I love food way too much. Take a diet, lose it, go off the diet, diet, go off the diet. I know what it takes to change, but I have problem passing up those, you know, those pork belly tacos and the rice and beans. Or some of those Filipino foods, even though some of them I have to watch, I've been told, don't ask what it is, just eat it. You know? It's, I like food. I enjoy food. But I know what's, what would it take to change. Everybody wants progress. Nobody wants to change. Let's do it. I'm all on board. Let's go. 
What are you going to do? Nothing. I'm not changing. I'm the same old way. I'm talking to us, McKeever Baptist Church. I'm talking to us. This, this is who God has here today. I'm talking to us. My goodness, no one wants change. We all want progress. See what happens? Change, you know what change is going to do? It's going to push you out of your comfort zone. But I don't like to do that. That makes me uncomfortable. Change will get you out of your rut. It changes your routine. Change will challenge your priorities. You say, oh, that's not my priority. Yes, it is, because that's the way you live. Yes, it is, Donnie. That's the way I live. Change will introduce us to a whole new set of problems. Something happened, oh, the other day. <sighs> Getting ready to, to go out. Where's my laptop? It's my brain. Where's my laptop? Couldn't find my laptop. Oh, I, I looked at Alice. I said, and I know, and I've said this before, and, and James chapter 1, verse 2 came to mind when I said it. And I th said, Lord, I really don't need this. Well, I found, it. I found a laptop after that. But it opens us up to a new set of problems. Change will upset your apple cart. Change will kick you out of that recliner. Sometimes that recliner feels really good. Of course, I can tell you how to take care of your recliner issue. If you just feel like you cannot get out of your recliner, get yourself a great day. And let that great Dane in the house, and that great Dane will claim that recliner. That recliner sits right beside my bed, and she'll get out of that recliner, and then she'll get back in that recliner, and of course it just rocks like this, but she's become accustomed to it. She, that'll kick you out of the recliner. Change will rearrange your daily schedule. Listen to this statement. If you want what you've never had, you've got to do what you've never done. If you want what you've never had, you've got to do what you've never done. If you want to see McKee Road Church filled with people, people walking the aisles to get saved, people's lives being changed because of the preaching of the gospel, guess what? We need to do something we've never done. We've got to change. We've got to change. It's time for change, McKee Road Baptist. It's time for change. I'm getting to be an old man. I don't want to stumble across the finish line. I want to go right across that finish line, full speed. Then Jesus said unto them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me. Even so send I you, John chapter 20, verse 21. And then he gave his standing orders. He said, Go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. That's Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, the Great Commission. Our God is not the God of status quo. Our God is not the God that says, I want you just to remain as you are. I want you to grow in me. I want you to make yourself available. We need to start asking ourselves this question. So what do I need to change in my life? What needs to change in my life? See, first he's going to shake us up. And then he's going to use us to shake up the world. Now, this can be applied to missions in a foreign field. But specifically, I'm talking about right here. I'm talking about your world. Those people that you come in touch with. Those people that you, God has allowed you to be an influence in their life. If the church is going to be changed, we must change. Because we are his church. And that's what we talked about on Wednesday night. It's not this building, it's the people. It's the people. We're his church. We desperately need to be shaken out of our complacency. Shaken out of our complacency. Have you ever spoken to somebody and talked to them <clears throat> and they came to you with a problem, a situation in their life? And you're looking at them and you're thinking, I've got the answer. <clears throat> I know what you need, and, it, and you just can't get it across, and you want to, Danny, you want to just go down and grab them by the shoulders and shake them. Listen, listen. That's the way I feel like God is with us. Listen. Listen, McKee Road Baptist member. I want you to change. We need to awake out of our slumber. 
Oh, my gosh. So much going on in this world, it's easy to get tired. I did not want to get up this morning. I was tired. I wanted to turn back over. Just wanted to lay there. But I knew that I need to be in God's church. Not just because I'm preaching, but I need to be in God's church with God's people. You know what? This is a tough one. We need to be convicted by our indifference. <clears throat> Convic convicted by our indifference. What are you saying? I don't care. That's okay with me. Yeah, they need to know the Lord. But I'm not going to do anything. I'm indifferent. We need to be shocked out of our lethargy. That's a lack of energy and enthusiasm. We just kind of go, oh. it's going to be too much work. Too much work. We need to change. Why? So that we might become what God wants us to be. God granted that would happen here at McKee Road Baptist Church. That it would happen here at McKee Road Baptist Church. There are certain steps that must take if God is going to do the things that we're not used to. And it'll be different, folks. It will be different. I'm not talking about changing doctrine or anything. I'm just talking about our personal walk with the Lord. Our availability to the yielding to the Holy Spirit. Uh, when he speaks to us in that still small voice, that we respond. What has God put in your heart to do? Let's find a way for the, you to do that here at church. And this must happen to you and me. We take our cue from the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our passage this morning is very familiar to us, as I mentioned. And it comes at a strategic point in the gospel in Matthew. In chapters 5 through 7, Jesus lays out the principles for his kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount. And then, in chapters 8 through 9, he displays his power. Here's what he does. He displays his power. If you've been doing your Bible reading, you've gone, gone through these, most likely. He cleanses a leper. He heals a centurion's son. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He calms the steed. He casts out the demons. He heals a woman, raises the dead, gives sight to the blind, gives speech to a man who couldn't speak. That's the background of what we read in verse 35, where it said, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Then something happens at the end of chapter 9. Something happened. I remember I was talking to a preacher friend of mine, and he was talking about how that Jesus, they were talking to Jesus, and, and he said, in essence, that uh, that power is of my Father God. But after the resurrection, something happened because it says, in the Great Commission, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Something happened. It's exciting when you read God's Word and you see these little things. But something happened at the end of chapter 9 that turned the disciples from spectators to missionaries. I submit many children of God sitting in a church body are spectators. Are spectators. It's like the family that went to church one day and, and uh, the father complained about the services and the wife complained that another lady had the same on, dress, same dress that she had on and the, the, the older sister was, had a complaint about the youth group because they didn't talk to her and the little boy said, oh, I thought it was a pretty good show for just a nickel. You know? We are spectators. We are spectators. What happened? Well, I think, number one, they saw a neglected flock. A neglected flock. In verse 36, it says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. It all starts with seeing. Somehow we, got, we have got to learn to see the crowds. We've got to see the multitudes around us. You know, it's easy to see something. You heard the old saying, couldn't see the forest for the trees. How many times have you driven down the road and you maybe you've been on that road, I don't know, 
a hundred times. And you look over and go, oh, I didn't know that was there. You never saw it. You never saw it. It's happened to me. Jesus saw the multitudes. It's easy to sit and daydream while the crowds pass you by. Crowds will wear you out. I mean, uh, the crowd on the freeway, the crowded freeway, when we lived down in Southern California, the crowded freeway, that would wear you out just driving down through that crowd. By the way, Bakersfield's getting in the way, you know, trying to get these roads opened up soon so you don't have so much of that. But it's going to happen. Leave me alone. I've seen enough people. Jesus had been busy for days. Very busy. But he saw the multitudes. He saw the multitudes. To see the crowds of the world, it requires something inside has to change. What changes? It, changed, it changes the way I look at humanity. It changes the way I look at people. Don't just see them as a bunch of people. Look at them. I wonder if they know the Lord is their Savior. I wonder if I can be a help to that individual. That individual over there really looks like they're down and out. I've got a couple dollars in my pocket. I can go buy them a sandwich. The good works. The good works. We tend to hang around people that we look like and talk like, don't we? Don't we? Have you ever been in a crowd, maybe at the mall or something like this, and you're, you're there by yourself, and you look up and you see somebody you know? What happens? All of a sudden, you're drawn to that individual. You go to them, and everybody around you disappears. That's what we're good at. That's what we're good at. We need to have our spiritual eyes on so that we can see the crowds. Jesus saw something that the disciples did not see. The world's full of people like us. The first, the first thing we need to do is to see them. Secondly, they were moved with compassion. Moved with compassion. The word means to feel it in your bowels. When we talk about feeling something, we talk about in our heart, you know, in our heart. But in the first century, it went down lower. Down lower. It's like a feeling in their gut. A feeling in their gut. And they were moved with compassion. It means to be emotionally moved by what you see around you. Emotionally moved. Are you emotionally moved when you realize that vast majority of people you're going to see today, you understand and know they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior? What are we doing? Something needs to change. We need to know their true condition. Jesus said the people... We're like sheep without a shepherd. He used two particular words to describe this situation. First, they fainted. Why'd they faint? They were fainting because they were burdened and worried with the traditions of their fathers. I'll tell you what, practicing, practicing a dead religion will wear you out. And yet, many children of God come into his house, and it seems as though we practice the religion the same way. We practice our personal religion with God the same way. If there's nothing going on between you and God, you're going to burn out. You're going to burn out. And then secondly, they're helpless. They're scattered abroad. They're in great danger of loss of their souls. Understand what Jesus is saying. I almost emailed this point to, to Dana to put on the screen. I'm getting closer. You've got some steps here. You've got seeing, you've got feeling, you've got knowing. Okay? Oh, stay with me. Until you see, folks, until we see spiritually, we're not going to feel. Until I can see and recognize the problem, I'm not going to feel. Until you feel, you're not going to notice. You're not going to know. Until you know, you're not going to care. Until you care, you will not pray. And until you pray, you will not go. There's some steps we need to go through here. The world's full of wounded people, bruised, mangled, cast down, bleeding, slowly dying. They don't know. 
We must pray, Lord, open our eyes. Open my eyes. That I might see this world like you do. It was a neglected flock. But what we also got, folks, is a wasted harvest. A wasted harvest. Verses 37 and 38, he says, let me turn back the page. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The key word is in verse 37. It's a little word. It's then. It's then. He saw, he felt, he knew, then he called his disciples to action. You know, we have a surprising opportunity in front of us. When you serve God, you get to be front row. You get to be in that box seat of seeing God do the miracles that he, only he can do. It's a miracle when someone comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. It's a miracle that only he can do. It's a miracle when we watch him take a life that's been ruined because of alcohol or drugs or you name it. It can be any kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Ellis? Addiction. That's the word I was looking for. It can be any kind of addiction. It can be sexual. But God can free you for that. And when you're walking with God in his Holy Spirit, and he's using you to be that influence in that individual's life you get to watch front row that miracle the harvest truly is plenteous it's truly as plenteous how many have been a farmer anybody done actual farming farming okay or maybe a lot of gardening okay it takes work get out there what do you do you till the ground you prepare the soil you bring in some fertilizer something that's going to put give rich nutrients into the soil and then you go out there and you start to water you plant the seed you start to water that crop and it comes up and then you get out there and you start weeding and pulling those weeds and throwing them away why because they'll choke out what you're trying to grow and it's all pointed toward the harvest toward the harvest now with crops harvest only comes at a certain time this harvest I'm talking about is continual. Harvest time. It's harvest time. Harvest time. These fields are always white under harvest. Always white under harvest. The harvest is plentiful over the whole world. That's the good news. But the harvest needs workers. Are you a worker? Are you a laborer this morning? Well, God didn't call me to preach. God didn't call me to do this. No. But God didn't call you just to sit. He called you to serve. He expects us to be obedient children. There's, pretty a, there's a pretty somber ob observation in all this when you realize that the laborers, according to the word of God, are few. The laborers are few. This is nothing new. What will make McKee Road Baptist Church a shining lighthouse that we would desire to see, not for our own glory, but to praise him and to see his gospel proclaimed? It's going to be that we've got laborers here, many laborers. <clears throat> What's God put in your heart to do? What has God put in your heart to do? Are we so detached from God and his Holy Spirit that he never speaks to us? And it doesn't give you a desire of something to do? I submit that if we would draw close to him, we'd recognize that God is speaking to us and there's something he wants us to do. <clears throat> the church's primary response to the needs of the world can be summed up in one word. Pray. 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 Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Why? He knows where the seeds are planted. He knows when the harvest is ready. He knows how many workers are needed. Evidently, there's more than what he was wanting here because he said the laborers are few. There's not very many. Not very many. How are we to pray? We're to pray to send forth laborers. 
this, is, this Greek word here, it's a very, very powerful word, comes, it's ekbalo, ek means out, and balo means to throw, like a baseball, to throw. What he's talking about, it's, uh, it's like to, well, it's where we get our English word ballistic, which is like an explosion, like out of the gun, when you shoot, and that hammer hits, and it hits that bullet, and it goes. We're to throw out laborers from this body. Not, we're throwing you out of the church, okay? But in a good way. We're throwing you out to be laborers in his harvest field. Whether that winds up to be into a foreign country, I don't know. But certainly in our world here, we need to be thrown out of this church. Kind of going back to our messages in Corinthians where we found out that the church of Corinth had been invaded by the city in all their philosophy and all their ways, when it should be the reverse. The city should invade. The, uh, the church should invade the city. We need to pray that God would light a fire in our church, ignite something, and people would just explode out of here to be laborers. We need to throw laborers to the east side of Bakersfield. We need to throw laborers to the west side of Bakersfield. We need to throw laborers to Taft. We need to throw laborers to the Sikhs around here. Oh yes, there's a lot of harvest needs to go on around here, folks. Hudson Taylor was a pioneer, pioneer missionary to China. He spoke about the need for additional workers on the field and he put the matter this way. I'll read. He said, the great need is not for more elaborate pleas for help. <clears throat> if we are to meet the needs of the world, two things must happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. He said, first, there must be an earnest prayer of the Lord to the harvest. We need to be praying. Send forth laborers. Send forth laborers. You know why that is? Because pretty soon you'll find out I'm a laborer. He wants me to go forth in my work. He wants me to go forth in my work and harvest. And secondly, there must be a deepening of the spiritual life of the church so that men will be unable to stay home. Something happened in their life. Something changed them from the status quo. I can't stay home. That may mean that you just simply get up and go down to the Lowe's or Home Depot guys and, and because you might need this or that, but I'm looking for an opportunity to be a laborer. I really mean that. Looking for an opportunity. You know, Hudson Taylor was exactly right. Exactly right. One preacher said this, we need to care more than some think is wise. You know, you might go up to somebody and you say, I'm, God has called me to this field. And somebody might think, eh, that's not wise. You need to care more than some would think is wise. You need to risk more than some might think is safe. You need to dream more than some think is practical. And that's kind of where I'm at right here with McKee Baptist. We need to dream what God would do with this body of believers. And then we need to expect more that some think is impossible. There will always be someone that will go, oh, that's a phlegmatic, huh, Alice? They'll throw cold water on your, your dreams. Oh, well, good for you, but it's not going to work, you know. Oh, McKee Road Baptist, you're just going to run 40, 50, 60 people. That's, that's who you are. Doesn't have to be that way. Doesn't have to be that way. But something's got to change. My God's not the God of status quo. He wants to change. That brings us back to this prayer. Lord, do the things we're not used to. As a young man, I wanted to see God work in my life. And I can tell you stories where I saw God work in my life. It was evident that God was doing something, that I was serving the true and the living God. But something had to change. What needs to change in you this morning? 
that something will be different here in this body of believers. Don't be afraid. He's a wonderful father. He's a wonderful father. He'll never do anything to hurt you. But he's not the God of status quo. Every head bowed and every eye closed. <clears throat> every head bowed and every eye closed. Is this your prayer this morning? Lord, do things in my life that I'm not used to. Lord, I want to see you work in my life. Lord, I want to be used by you. Lord, I want to be a laborer in your harvest. Is that your prayer? See, here's the problem, folks. We've got eyes, but we don't see. We've got ears, but we don't hear. We don't look with our spiritual eyes and see the things that are needed. We hear the word of God preach, but, and that's good, but it's not for me. We don't hear. We have lips, but we don't speak. Oh, we'll speak all the words uh, that we uh, want to speak if it's good for us, but if it's on God's behalf, we don't speak. And then we have feet, but we don't go. We don't go. Our prayer should be, oh God, do things we're not used to. Do things that would baffle and amaze us if I knew them in advance. That's the God that we serve. That is the God we serve. Some of us are afraid to try it. Will you be a laborer this morning? I pray that you will. Father, I'd ask that you have your will and way in these few moments of invitation. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Stand with me together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. <clears throat>